the grand finale of Carlota. We're going to read chapters 25 and 26. Rains came with the new year and they lasted for more than a month. We had managed to save half our cattle, all of our working horses, and some of the Mestenos. And we decided that was Mustangs, right? But most of these wild horses in our part of the country, Don Roberto had rounded up because there wasn't food for them and had driven over the high cliffs at Punta de Laguna, Laguna when the spring grass was just beginning to show. Mr. Thomas rode up to the ranch and announced that he had come for beef cattle. He bought 70 tough steers, paying us 90 centavos a head, and drove them off the same day to San Diego. About a month later, I found out why he had bought the cattle. One day, as our mayordomo came back from San Diego with a wild tale. Early in the morning, the mayordomo told us, that was three months ago in January, a man named Marshall, who was a carpenter and was building a grist mill for a man named Sutter, he had just finished building a flume from the river to the mill. One morning, he went down to the flume to shut off the water. There, at the bottom of the flume, he saw pieces of what he thought might be gold. He pounded it between rocks, and when it changed its shape but did not break in two, he was certain it was gold. Almost certain, that is. A few days later, he went to Sutter's and showed him the pieces he had found in the flume. They tested them and proved that they were gold. Right then, the two men decided to keep what they found a big secret. But shortly afterward, a man named Brannon <laughs> found some gold, and he galloped to San Francisco and rode down the street, shaking a bottle of gold dust over his head and shouting, Gold! 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 From the American River! Within a week, all the sailors in San Francisco Harbor deserted their ships. Carpenters dropped their hammers. A nearby town opened its jail. Thousands flocked to the mill and clawed it to pieces, looking for gold. Three Frenchmen pulled up a tree stump and found a fortune in gold, hanging onto its roots. Imagine if you were able a fortune from a tree stump. Two days late, two days after he had told us this tale, Juan Diaz took six horses from our corral and rode off at a gallop for the north. We all thought Juan was crazy, but he was not crazy. The story he had told us was true. Before the month of May was gone, a steady line of men on horses began to troop up the King's Highway along the western boundary of Dos Hermanos. They were on their way to the gold fields. When I went to San Diego, I learned that these men, about 400 of them, had crossed the Isthmus of Panama and there bought passage to San Francisco. But the crooked captain of the ship carried them only as far as San Diego. He told them they were in San Francisco and then sailed back to Panama to pick up another cargo, leaving the men stranded 200 leagues south of the gold fields. Our vaqueros reported that the gold seekers stole a band of horses and slaughtered our cows during the first few days, so I went down to the highway to move our stock out of reach. A herd of cattle had strayed, and these we drove back. I had three vaqueros with me. As we crossed the highway, we encountered two men riding white gildings and leading two mares. I knew the horse by sight. They bore the Z brand of Dos Hermanos. As we pulled up in front of them, I thought of the time my father and I had stopped the band of gringo thieves. The geldings belonged to Dos Hermanos, I said to the two young men. I was still angry that we had found the carcasses of more than 40 of our cows scattered along the King's Highway. The gringos at least could have slaughtered our steers and not our breeding stock. I spoke in Spanish. The one with the long blonde hair and blue eyes looked puzzled. The other young man answered me in Spanish, and I saw that he was a Spaniard. We bought the horses, he said. That story I am acquainted with, I said. I have heard it many times, and I am tired of hearing it. I repeat, senorita, the horses we have bought. We paid ten pesos apiece for them, except one of the mares, which cost four pesos. He turned away and spoke to the gringo in, the, in gringo language, whereupon the young man with the long blonde hair fumbled around in a small bag he had tied to his saddle horn and pulled out a piece of paper. He swung his horse around, edged up to me, and handed it over. At the top of the paper were the words, Sunrise Grocery Store, and below it, Caleb Thomas Crump, which means proprietor. Farther down was a notation and then a signature that I recognized as belonging to Thomas. Mr. Thomas, I said, did not own the horses he sold you. They bear our brand. 
The Spaniard spoke to the gringo, who continued to look puzzled. I noticed the name in gilt letters on the valise. He had it tied to his saddle. It read, Dr. John Brett. The gringo fumbled around in his valise and pulled out some paper money, a fistful, and handed it to me. They're gone, he said. The Spaniard said, he wants to pay for the horses. I looked at the gringo, who was not much older than I. I glanced at his long blonde hair and blue eyes and the way his long legs hung down in the stirrups. I glanced at his valise, which was very new, and at the fresh gilt letters that spelled out his name. He was the nicest looking gringo I had ever seen. Here comes the romance. With your permission, the doctor and I will continue the journey, the Spaniard said. I have a long way to go. Where are you bound? I said, though I knew. To seek fortune in the gold field. And the other, I said, pointing. He is a doctor and will pursue his profession somewhere along our coast, perhaps in Santa Barbara. Tell your friend, I said, that there are no doctors in the Pueblo of San Diego or in the country around. The only one that I know of is in Pueblo, Los Angeles. I will impart your information, said the Spaniard, who was one to talk importantly. Don't, do not forget, I reminded him. The white gelding the young doctor was riding had a bad way, and I remembered of shying at anything that moved suddenly, a twig, a bush, anything. I told one of the vaqueros to untie a gelding that we had with us. It was one of our best horses. Inform the doctor that the gelding he rides is not trustworthy, and ask him to dismount while my vaquero changes saddles. The doctor got off his horse and stood holding his new valise. He looked much better standing on the ground than he did sitting in the saddle. When the new horse was saddled, he climbed up and tied his valise to the horn. He said something in Spanish as they rode off along the King's Highway. He had a gringo's voice, but it was soft. I watched him bouncing up and down in the saddle, the small valise swinging from the saddle horn. I watched as he came to a little rise and then disappeared in the yellow dust and the bright sun. This is the last chapter, chapter 26. Here we go. Let's see if they if she ends up with the doctor. I keep trying to matchmake her. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's just living in a hard world and trying to manage the ranch on her own. And when Doña Dolores passes away, she's going to really struggle. My grandmother wanted to know what I had seen on my journey to the King's Highway. She was sitting in her sala smoking Caleb Thomas's tobacco. Rosario stood nearby, waving a fan made of a manzanita branch. I found the carcasses of many cows, I said. The gringos, Doña Dolores said. Yes, they are a swarm of insects. Not all, I said. <laughs> Not all, I said. What about this doctor? I encountered a doctor on the King's Highway. Senor Thomas had told him some, sold him some of our horses, and when I accused the doctor of stealing them, he offered me a handful of money. Did you take it? Yes, I answered. I decided to say nothing about giving the young gringo one of our best horses. Doña Dolores said, Horses and cattle should bring a price now that the gringos are upon us like insects. But what we need is someone to bargain with them. A man. I'll bargain. You would give the ranch away before the summer is out. A strong man should be in charge of Dos Hermanos, not a girl. Wow, Grandma doesn't believe in girl power, I guess. I said nothing more because I was too angry to trust my tongue. Doña Dolores was watching me. I do not mean to offend you, she said. <laughs> I don't want to offend you, but you can't run this ranch. <laughs> I don't mean to offend you, she said, but I must speak the truth. The ranch is big. It has 47,000 acres, all of them good. It is not a plaything. It requires strong hands, a man. I did not reply, but asked her permission to be, to be away for a moment. I went to the room where our leather goods were made. Here I picked up a footstool that had been lying around for a year, and I took it back to the sala and placed it on the floor in front of Doña Dolores. What is this? she asked, eyeing the stool. A place for your feet. I have a place for my feet. Two more of our Indians have gone north to find gold, I said. Rosario is needed. My grandmother was smoking. She tossed the half-finished cigarillo into the fireplace and straightened herself. He is needed here, she said, raising her voice. 
now and tomorrow. Here, the golden eagle was still screaming in the courtyard. Rosario is needed in other places, I said, and again, asking my grandmother's permission, I left her to fume. The big eagle was still screaming, and Rosario was getting ready to feed him. It had always made me sad to see the great winged bird sitting there in the courtyard, chained to a perch. Most of the time he sat with his feathers ruffled and his eyes half closed. I said to Rosario, let the eagle go. How? He has a chain with a file which you can borrow tomorrow from the blacksmith and use it to file the chain. Would it not be better if the blacksmith filed the chain? I wish you to file the chain. I leave, said Rosario. When he came back, we both used the file and cut the silver chain. The eagle did not know that he was free. He stood as he had stood before, drooping his wings, watching us with his golden eyes. I gave him a push, and he fell on the ground. I pushed him again, which he answered with a claw. He craned his neck and walked away. He spread his wings and ever so softly rose above the gate and the roof. He made a circle above us and another still higher. Then he flew off toward the mountains, toward the high mesas beyond the mountains. He returns to the country he came from, I said. The Paiute country, Rosario said. Do you wish to follow him, I said. Yes, but how? On a horse. What horse do you speak of? A horse that I will give you. On Tiburon? The Paiutes are not bashful Indians. No, on Sixto, senorita. Sixto. And a saddle? Yes. With silver? With silver. A red poncho? Red. When? Now, I said, because I have much work to do. And that is the end of the story. So she set the eagle free. And she's going to run the ranch. And Doña Dolores is going to disapprove of her running the ranch. <laughs> and they all lived happily ever after. And maybe the doctor will come by for a visit. <laughs> maybe she'll sprain her ankle and he'll come by. All right. I have really enjoyed reading aloud to you. And I hope that you've enjoyed listening to stories. I think that's one of my favorite parts about um, being in the classroom is I really like reading with, with you guys, and I really um, enjoy doing read-alouds, but I enjoy also some of the reading that we did this year in reading groups. Um, I want to tell you how important reading is in my life. It's something that brings me great joy. It's also something that makes me smarter every time I read. I feel like I learn something new every time I read, even a fiction book. Um, or especially nonfiction, I learn new things. Um, so I hope that you also feel that same joy in reading and realize that knowledge is power and the way to get knowledge is through reading. And the more you read, the more you learn and the more powerful you become as a person and the more interesting you are as a person because your brain is filled with information and beautiful stories. Anyhow... I'm going to get all weepy saying goodbye and signing off. So um, I hope you enjoyed all of these read-alouds. And if you want to listen to them again over the summer, uh, feel free to. Um, if you'd like to figure out a way to record more stories for me um, and you're interested in doing that for your classmates, just let me know. You can email me, and I'd love you to do that. Anyhow, I will talk to you later.